Howdy! Welcome to Aspire Mountain Academy. I'm Professor Curtis, your instructor for this course in Introductory Statistics. In less than 10 minutes, this video discusses how to interpret measures of center. Let's get started. Let's take a look at how to interpret measures of center. We can calculate different measures of center, but any numbskull monkey can be trained to do that. Knowing what those values actually mean and what they represent about a data set is what's really important. Now, Keep in mind, a typical convention when calculating measures of center is to carry one more decimal place than is present in the original data set. If my original set of values are rounded to two decimal places, then the convention would be to calculate, say, a mean value to three decimal places. So just use one more decimal place than what you use in the actual data set itself. To interpret a measure of center, you need to think about whether the results are reasonable. This is actually good practice when evaluating the result of any calculation. You also need to consider the method that's used to collect the sample data. As we've already seen, how you sample your data matters a great deal. Now, just because you can calculate the mean and median doesn't indicate those values will be meaningful statistics. Remember when we discussed the mode and said it's the only meaningful statistic when treating nominal data? Well, we've seen before that categorical data can be numerical. And when there are numbers, you can calculate a mean and median value, but that doesn't mean that those values have any sort of meaning in the real world. Just because something's numerical doesn't mean it's quantitative data. And just because you can calculate mean and median values doesn't mean they're going to have any sort of significance in the real world. For example, let's suppose you were to rank by sales selected statistics textbooks. You take a random sampling from the population and picked out number 1, 4, 7, 12, and 15. And with this data set in hand, we can calculate the mean and the median, but those numbers won't translate back into the real world because the numbers that represent rank are just categories. Take the mean value. It's 7.8. So what does that mean? You go 8 tenths of a category between number 7 and number 8? What's that? You see, it just doesn't translate back. The median value of 7 is the same deal. What meaning does the middle value have when all the values are names? And here's another example. The jersey numbers of the starting offense for the New Orleans Saints when they last won the Super Bowl. Again, this is, a numerical, this is numerical data, but it's not quantitative data. It's categorical data because each of these jersey numbers is like the name for a unique individual. Now, you can take a mean value and a median value, but when you go to translate that back into the real world, what does that mean? Nothing. Just because something numerical allows you to calculate the mean and the median value, don't be fooled into thinking that those values will have any sort of real-world significance. The only measure of center that has any meaning with categorical data is the mode, and that's it. Let's practice what we've learned in this and previous mini lectures by comparing the mean, median, mode, and mid-range of the heights of elected U.S. presidents uh, with that of their electoral opponents. Go ahead, pause the video here, get into the POTUS file in our StatCrunch group and calculate these values. Then come back here and we'll retrace the steps of how to do this and see how well you did. Okay, let's see how well you did. Once your data is in StatCrunch, you go to Stat, Summary Stats, Columns. Then in your Options window, select your columns. Note that you can select two columns of data and have both of them show up in your Results window. Select your Stats and then press Compute. And you get this wonderful Results window with the stats for both columns of data appearing in two rows in your Results window. This is really convenient when you need to compare the same stats for two different samples or populations because it places the numbers you need to compare right next to each other. Note that the order in which you selected the columns in your options window is the same order in which they appear in the results window. If your results window looks something like this, good job. If you've got this in two separate windows or you didn't get anything like this, please pause the video here, go back to StatCrunch, try this again. Now, do the mean and median values here suggest a significant difference between the heights of elected U.S. presidents and their electoral opponents? 
Consider a difference greater than 5% to be significant. Well, what do you think? I'll give you a moment to respond. Well, 5% of the mean value of 180 is 9. So if you examine the differences between each of the different stats, all of those differences are less than 9, which means they're all within the 5% threshold. And since none of the differences exceed 5%, none of them are considered, none of these differences are considered to be significant. And that means each of the stats are in the same neighborhood. Okay, let's look at a different part of the POTUS data set. What is the mean and median number of years U.S. presidents live after they leave office? Pause the video, go back to the data file in StatCrunch, calculate the stats to answer this question. I'll wait right here until you get back. Okay, once your data is in StatCrunch, you want to go to Stat, Summary Stats, Columns. In the Options window, you want to select the column with your data, select the mean and median stats to calculate, and press Compute. Here's what comes out. If you didn't get this, pause the video, go back to StatCrunch, try this again until you get it down. Now, are these measures of center at all meaningful? I'll give you a moment to respond. Well, they certainly are. They say that U.S. presidents live an average of 15 years after being elected. So a president who serves just one term would live an average of 11 years after leaving office. That's good for an organization like the Secret Service to know because they are charged with protecting former U.S. presidents and their spouses after leaving office, as well as during their service. Now, it used to be that protection lasted for life, but escalating costs forced Congress to revise that policy. The respective bill was signed into law by President Bill Clinton, and of course, it doesn't apply to him, else he would never have signed it into law. But every president after him will receive Secret Service protection for only 10 years after leaving office. Again, that, seemed, that number seems to be based on the data, okay? After the 10 years, they're on their own. If they want continued protection, they must hire their own security and pay for it themselves, just like anybody else little interesting tidbit for you. And that brings us to the end of this mini lecture. I hope you found it helpful. You can find more mini lectures for this and other courses at AspireMountainAcademy.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.